Coca-Cola. So what's a substitute good for Coca-Cola? Pepsi-Cola, right? So if we're talking about two liter bottles, they might sell for say $1.49 each. Both of them do. Both of them do. So what I want to know is this. If the price of the related good Pepsi-Cola goes up, what happens to the demand for the good in question Coca-Cola? How do we know that? Because if the price of it is more, people want less of that, so they're going to buy Coca-Cola instead. If the price of Pepsi goes up, they'll buy less Pepsi and they'll buy more Coca-Cola. So in this case here, we have the demand for Coca-Cola. So suddenly we want one, and they both sell for $1.49. The question is, what if the price of Pepsi increases? Probably not. But if they like cola, what are they going to do? They're going to buy Coca-Cola. So what's the rule? For substitute goods, they go in the same direction. Price of Pepsi goes up, demand for Coca-Cola goes up. Price of Pepsi goes down, demand for Coca-Cola goes down. So that's what you want in the notes. For substitute goods, they go in the same direction. For substitute goods, they go in the same direction. For substitute goods, they go in the same direction. Pepsi goes up, cost, price, demand for Coca-Cola goes up. That's a demand increase. The price of Pepsi goes up, the demand for Coca-Cola goes up. And the second good here is what we call a complementary good. Complementary goods go together or are used together. gasoline and automobiles. They're used together. They go together. So in this case, we'll have the market for the complementary good. And the market is going to be the demand. The demand is going to be a new golf clubs. I know a lot of you don't play golf. If you don't play golf, golf, you need golf clubs. And we have this demand for golf clubs, D1. And the complementary good is going to be golf balls. Golf balls, if you buy brand new golf balls about decent quality, you're going to pay about a dollar, dollar and a half for each one. Okay? The average golfer the average golfer probably loses in 18 holes because of woods and water and things like that. The average golfer is probably going to lose anywhere from two to five golf balls per 18 holes. And it's no big deal, they cost a dollar a piece, okay? But you have to have golf clubs to play golf with golf balls, right? So the question is, what's going to happen to the demand for new golf clubs, the complementary good, if the price of golf balls increase in price, and remember, it only cost about a dollar a piece before the increase, increase in price to $183 each. Now remember, the average golfer loses anywhere from two to five golf balls per 18 holes. Is anybody going to take up golf knowing that when they lose two to five golf balls, they're out anywhere from $400 to $1,000? The answer is no. So if the price of golf balls increases, what does that tell us? The demand for golf clubs goes down. 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 So what's the rule? So when the price of golf balls increase, the demand for golf clubs goes down. It decreases and it shifts to the left. Okay. So we said with substitute goods, they go in the same direction. What's the rule for complementary goods? 
they go in opposite directions. Price of golf balls goes up, the demand for golf clubs goes down. Price for golf balls goes down, the demand for golf clubs goes up. So I see that? So for complementary goods, they go in opposite directions. For complementary goods, this goes up and this goes, the price goes up and the demand goes down. Complementary goods go in the opposite direction, substitutes go in the same direction. And that was number four in the determinants of demand. And number five is expectation. Expectations. And again, we're going to do a market here. We say that this is the market for housing. This is the market for housing. And here we have the price of housing, and we have the, the quantity of housing, and we have a demand curve, D1 for housing. So how would expectations play into what's going to happen to housing? Now, we already talked about housing before. We talked about population number of buyers. So what we, over the long term, as the population and the number of buyers goes up, the demand for housing is going to go up long term. How does expectations play into housing? Expectations play a role in the demand for housing in the short run. Think about this. You're thinking about buying a house. You've just moved here. You've got a job. And you're thinking about buying a house. You're thinking about, here you go, find your name and check it off. We think about buying a house, and you're looking at this uh, $250,000 three-bedroom condo out on Route 1, and you realize, wait a minute, housing prices are going up by 10% per year in eastern Prince William County. So next year, that house is going to cost two seventy-five, dollars and you're thinking about buying it. Based on the expectations, it's going to cost another twenty-five dollars next year. What are you most likely to do now? Purchase it. Go ahead and buy it, right? Buy it now, next year it'll be worth 275. So if your expectations are that the price is going to go up, you buy it now. Does that make sense? Boats, houses, cars, whatever it is. However, if it's 2008 and you think, wait a minute, housing prices have been going down by 20%, that $250,000 house next year is probably going to sell for $200,000. Based on expectations, what are you going to do right now? I'm going to wait. I'm going to rent for a year. You see what I mean? So when it comes to things like houses and cars and stuff like that, if we expect the price to go up in the future, we buy now. But if we expect the price to come down in the future, we're going to wait. Does that make sense? By the way, that's exactly what happened between 2002 and 2008. Housing prices in the United States were going up and up and up. From 1945 to 2002, the average increase in price value of a new and used home went up by about 3% per year. And for a variety of reasons, it was up about more. Between 2002 and, two, and the end of 2007, housing prices and value started going up by 5% per year, 10% per year. And in 2006, they went up by 20%. So if it's 2005 and I expect the price to go up by 20% next year, I buy it now. And that dramatically increases the demand for housing. And to, at the end of 2007, the housing bubble burst. In 2008, housing prices or values fell by 20%. What happened to the demand for housing at the end of 2008? It just stopped. Nobody's going to buy a house anywhere in the United States at the end of 2008 if they know that next year that house is going to be worth 20% less. I'm not going to buy a $200,000 house knowing that next year is going to be worth 160. I'm not going to do it. Did I see that? So, now notice this is a short-run phenomenon. This is a short-run phenomenon. So, expectations played a role in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 because housing prices or values were falling. And the housing market just took a beating. There were million-dollar homes that sold for a million dollars in 2006 that by the time you got to 2012, I actually went to an auction for a house on, a, in Nag said, a waterfront house, 14 bedrooms, 14 bedrooms, indoor swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool. 
In 2005, at the end of 2005, this house sold for $3 million. Why did it sell for $3 million? Because people said, I'll pay $3 million for it. Next year, it'll go up by 10%. It'll be worth $3,300,000. And then the bubble burst. My buddy Jim called me. He said, hey, man, there's a house that we stayed in a couple of years ago, and it's up for auction. The, the banks up there went into foreclosure. And people lost it. And, and uh, you want to go down there and bid on it? And I said, no. No. <laughs> Nothing on the waterfront where hurricanes can blow it down. Thank you very much. He said, man, I think we can get it cheap. Now, we had stayed at this house. We used to have a tradition where we, a bunch of people I went to high school with, we, we, we'd get 30, 40, 50. One year we had 64 people for Thanksgiving. That's a lot of people at the But we would rent these four. We, one year we rented two 14 bedroom houses side by side, and young people were sleeping on couches. But he said, it's, it's in foreclosure. I think we can get it cheap. And I said, no, but I'll go with you. And so we went down there. This was 2011. Now, this house five years before sold for $3 million. And there were a bunch of us, a bunch of investors. We were down there, and I told Jim flat out, I said, I'm not, don't put my name on the list. Because Jim would get, he'd get like 10 people together, and everybody throws in some money, and you buy something expensive. None of us could afford it, but we could all throw in a little bit of cash. This house came up on the market. Now, it sold for $3 million previously. The, and the auctioneer stood up there, and he said, okay. I get the, it, the, all the furniture came with it, fully furnished. I mean, it had, and it had an indoor swimming pool, which I thought was weird. Um, and he said, okay, we're gonna start the bidding at $600,000. About 20 to 30 of us standing around there. And he said, all right, opening bid, of, who's gonna give me 600,000? And everybody went. <laughs> I told him, I said, that's probably a really good deal. He said, I think it is. I said, I'm not in. <laughs> no. Nobody bought it. Crazy. Why didn't somebody buy that house for $600,000? Because next year it might be worth $500,000, right? And Jim walked away. He said, Jerry, that's one of the stupidest things we, we've ever done. And I said, yeah, but I don't care. Next year if it's worth seven hundred, dollars fine. If it's worth five hundred, dollars I'm not in. I'm not participating. Guess what that house is worth now? A lot more. $3 million. So I, sh I showed them. <laughs> I'm not going to buy into that stuff. But you can see how these expectations, they did play a role in whether you're willing to buy now or buy later. And it changes in the short run expectations. I can give you an example. Prince William County, especially western Prince William County, in northern Virginia in general, but specifically in Prince William County, housing prices of values in 2018 went up by about 7%. And that's a lot, because if you buy a million dollar house, now it's worth a million seventy thousand. You see what I mean? And that's 70 grand, you didn't even do anything for it. You see how that, how that would change expectations? When housing values, turn your cell phone off please, when housing values are going up a lot, 7%, 5%, 10%, two things, number one, people buy now, because they want to buy before the price goes up. Well, what else do they do? How does that also change the buying habits of the public? You buy a bigger house. I want 7% of a million, not 7% of $100,000. 7% of $100,000 is seven grand. 7% of a million is $70,000. So it literally, those expectations change the demand, not only for the number of houses, but how big are those houses and how expensive. You actually will see, and you'll see this today, you'll see a couple with two children and they'll buy a six bedroom house in Western Prince William County for $600,000. Why? You really need a three bedroom house, don't you? One for each of the kids, one for you. But you don't want that $200,000 house in Bromsco Hills, you want the big one because you want 7% of the big number. So the next thing I want you to write in your notes uh, in a clear area of thing is just like we did with demand, we're going to switch over to the supply side. The quantity supply Q S is a point determined.
have the price. The price of the good in question. And number two, supply, capital S, is a line curve or schedule. Now notice when we talked about demand, we said quantity demanded as a point, right? Determined by the price of the good. I also said that demand was a, a line curve or a schedule. And I made the point that quantity demanded and demand are two different things. Same thing here. Quantity supplied is a point, just like quantity demanded is, and quantity supplied is determined by one thing and one thing only. What's the price of a good? Turn your cell phone off, please. So what do we conclude from that? What do we, what do we conclude from that? Price determines two things, right? Price determines quantity demanded, and price determines quantity supplied. The price will not change demand, and the price will not change the supply. There are other things that change the supply. Okay, price determines two things, quantity supplied and quantity demanded. Just like we did with demand, now we're going to come over here and we're going to write the law of supply. And the law of supply is uh, there. <clears throat> is a positive or 